<laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for attending, first of all, and Lucy for putting on or organising a lot of the event. Um, today is a chat about automating the hard part of AWS account management with a step function driven machine vending style offering. That's a mouthful. I appreciate that. We will go into it and get into a bit more and it will be simplified. Don't worry too much. So quick hello. Uh, I'm Peter. I'm the Cloud Platform Engineering Team Lead at CEF, or City Electrical Factors. Um, little background on myself, I started in ITIL service management a good few years ago now. Moved into DevOps engineering role and then entering the real world, which is Cloud Platform Engineering, the better world, as we would love you to believe. Um, CEF, as, as a company, who are we, what are we, what are we doing? Um, has anyone heard of CEF? You work there, that doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would imagine if anyone's heard of us, it's likely through electrical wholesale. Um, that is where we are, that's where we're known as, but we are currently improving upon the IT side of the business massively. So we're going from a very small IT company to the point where we've now got our own dedicated office in Durham, which we probably don't all fit in. Um, and we're on a bit of a journey. So at the minute we've got a really, really big, I apologize about the graphics. I'm not a graphic designer. That, that will show throughout this. Um, but we are currently going from a big on-premise legacy monolithic application. And the idea is to split that and push it into the cloud. Um, going through a bit of a rewrite at the same time. It's not just a lift and shift. So like I said, we're going from a large on-premise application to a serverless first, which is really interesting. Um, there's that, that's come with its own little hurdles, but it's, it's providing a lot of benefits. Um, Domain-driven designed microservice offering. As a team, we have our own challenges. So I'd mentioned the fact that we are going with a domain-driven design, which means that we've got more than that. But for example, we've got a number of software engineering teams across the business. And we offer a cross-cutting horizontal platform, as we are platform offering. You know, everything that, we, that they build into, we would deliver. And we do this by embedding a member of our team into each of the delivery teams <coughs> or software engineering teams. So within there, it's multi-skilled. You've got some developers, you've got some QA testers, you've got cloud platform engineers, you've got delivery leads. Our point of this is to be able to set standards across them all. So to deliver a similar thing across all domain teams and make sure that whatever we offer is there, they can feed back, we can feed back to the wider audience. What are you talking about? So, it's a mouthful, I appreciate that. So if we go back to the agenda of what we're talking about, we're talking about the pains of creating AWS accounts in a large scale. I mean, we're not talking about one or two little accounts here. We're, we're talking about dozens, hundreds, thousands of accounts. Um, is anyone here familiar with AWS, by the way, before I go plowing through? Excellent. Those who don't have hands up, any Azure? GCP? No, that's no surprise. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know AWS, I will attempt to clarify the services as we go. I'm not expecting anyone to be geniuses on the subject, though. So what are accounts, first of all, <clears throat> and why so many? So that may not be so easy to see. Don't worry. Um, I'm going I'm to explain it the way as we go through. Accounts are ways to separate resources, group them together. As you use resource groups, AWS uses accounts. It's a way to group them in logical fashion so that you can wrap, say, service control policies around them if you don't want certain things to be used with them. You can wrap access management around them. You can put them into organizational units within organizations so that, again, you can put that hierarchy structure in place. So AWS themselves say, an AWS account is a container for your AWS resources. You create and manage your AWS records in your account. The AWS account provides administrative facilities for access and billing. I apologize for reading what you can read. <clears throat> AWS accounts are free. Themselves are free. They're not going to charge you. So 
it seems a bit daft to ram everything into one account and then do some really complex access management rules. Separate it, make your life easier. Um, they can be used in AWS organizations to apply logical grouping and policies. That's really, really useful and important, and anyone who's worked with it will understand the value of that. They allow controlled access to certain resources via those grouping and policies and IAM management tools and all that kind of niceness that, that goes along with it. So, what are we actually talking about today at the minute? We're talking about registering AWS accounts using Control Tower. What's Control Tower? AWS says. <laughs> The essentially, Control Tower offers the easiest way to set up a governed, uh, a, a governed and secure multi-account AWS environment. They basically give you a landing zone. You create a load of stuff, and it allows you to register new accounts, which makes sure that wrappings that you apply apply to new accounts straight away. Takes away a lot of the a lot of the hard work essentially around it. So, how do you create a new account with Control Tower? With that form is about as good as it gets. So we've got an account email and a display name. We've then got the I am Identity Center username, uh, user email, username, first name, an organization unit that sits in. There's then a rather large expandable optional list, which is pretty useless if we're honest about it. It's, it's not great. <clears throat> so why not just use Account Factory? the AWS offer, why, why are we going down the effort and, and the road to do what we've done and build this step function vendor machine offering? Why not just use the AWS account factory? Well, you can. First, first point to note is that you absolutely can. I'm, I'm not here to tell you that it's the wrong thing to do. Everyone has different needs, different requirements. If, if all you are is a small startup business and you're gonna be creating three or four accounts, it would seem counterintuitive to go away and spend hours developing a system to save you no time at all because it would take you longer to do that than it would build the accounts out. But bear in mind that AWS console access must be provided to users to do this. You know, all CLI access needs to be given to users to do this. Some kind of access into the AWS environment needs to be given to the users. AWS says, by default, I am identity sent users that provision accounts must be in the AWS account factory group or the management group. It's not a small level of access in order to do this. You know, they could go and spin up lots and lots of accounts unnecessarily, which if you've got certain things auto deployed, starts cost. It's click ops. You know, we're trying, we're in a world now where we're trying to move away from people sitting, doing data inputting and clicking through things and next button, next button. We're trying to automate the world. Might be a bit of a, a long stretch, but we'll, we're trying. <clears throat> most, most importantly though, it's time consuming. Picking up on that time consuming a bit more, how long does it take per account to provision? Does anyone want to hazard a guess? Does anyone think that it might be higher than 10 minutes? Show of hands if you think it's more than 10 minutes. One person, two person. Would that shock you then? <clears throat> so AWS themselves say that account factory offering through Control Tower can take up to 35 minutes to create and provision a new account. That's, that's not a small amount of time. So if we have a look at the form, and we go, okay, let's, let's, take a, let's take a while, I guess, that it takes the, the average user maybe three minutes to fill the form in. If we have 35 minutes for the account to be created, plus the three minutes to fill the form in, we've now with 38 minutes of what could be, if you're limiting your access into your environment, quite an expensive engineering time. If we've got more than one account, so let, let's say we've got 20 accounts. Again, that's, that's absolutely feasible. I know that we are currently at about 128 with the plan to add at least another 100 in the next couple of months. We're at 760 minutes. If we divide that by 60, that's you know, over 12 and a half hours of time. And that's only for 20 accounts, that's, that's not a lot. Let's have a look at an enterprise scale. So if we want to scale up 150 accounts, you're looking at 95 hours of time required 
to fill this form in 150 times and wait for the accounts to be created. Ouch. <coughs> Concurrency limit. So as a lot of you probably thinking, well, yeah, well, I'll, I'll just set away 100 at a time. That's fine. I'll come back when they're done. Does anyone want to take a guess at what the current concurrency limit is for how many accounts can be created through Account Factory at one time? Does anyone think that it might be higher than 10? No, because we all got shocked by that last slide. <laughs> it's five. Five accounts at once. So even if we spent all that time doing five accounts and then waiting, you're still going to have that 35-minute wait before you can go back even into the form and set another one off. This was recent though. So on the 15th of December, AWS actually announced that they were excited to support concurrency and that they were able to update, create, or enroll up to five accounts at a time. So that, that's another thing. If you want to change one, you've used one of your slots, take a random guess as to how many it was before this date. One. <laughs> yeah, so suddenly that 96 hours has become a very, very realistic time consumption rate. For again, if you were only a small business and you'd paid for only a couple of engineers, what could be very expensive time? So, what can we do about it? Well, here's what we did, and you're never going to guess. We created a step function driven vendor machine offering. Hence the talk. A couple of points though, before I go through this, just to set expectations. Things that I won't cover, and that's exactly how to build this solution. And it's how every stage works and all the code involved. Mainly because we'll still be here next week. This is, this is mainly to get people thinking about the potentials of what this kind of solution could offer your business or your team. It's not to show you exactly how to do this. Besides, what we've done may not work for you. It would be a good place to start, but everywhere has different needs and different requirements. Also, it's worth noting at the moment, this isn't a finished product solution, nor should it be. I would argue that no product or nothing that you build, you should ever consider as done. If it's considered done, it's probably at the point where you're thinking about decommissioning it. You should always be thinking about how can we improve it? How can we make it better? What new services do our cloud providers now offer that weren't offered when we first built it that might integrate with this to make a better experience for our end user? So what are step functions? And I'm going to apologize because, again, it's more AWS extracts. But AWS themselves state that a step function is a visual workflow service that helps developers use AWS services to build distributed applications, automated processes, orchestrate microservices, and create data and machine learning pipelines. It's a bit of a mouthful. There's what they class as six, I believe, use cases for them. That's fun uh, function orchestration, branching, error handling, a human in the loop, so where you might want to fully automate something except you've got to wait for something. Maybe you want an authorization, click, yes, go. Maybe it's an input from some form that you want someone to fill in, a UI. Parallel processing and dynamic parallelism. So depending on outputs, different streams of work and activity will continue. There is a link at the bottom there if you want to know more. The AWS documentation on this is pretty good. Essentially, it's a workflow tool to allow triggering of different services, lambdas, um, step function parts themselves can offer connectivity via API endpoints. So what does it look like? I've managed to whip through 14 slides now and haven't really spoken about anything about what we're talking about tonight. So, there it is. To end, I know, yeah, look at that. It's, it's fairly simple, though, isn't it? I mean, who, who recognizes something like this? It's a workflow. So let's, if we take a closer look, there's a couple of things here that I've highlighted. The decisions. 
what happens depending on a condition that occurs within that step? Does it go through the left channel or the right channel? So here we've got, is it a create an account or is it a delete account? If it's a create account, it goes off down the left-hand side, create an account factory. If it's a delete, then it goes off on the left where it moves some accounts about and then suspends them. Down the bottom there, it's a loop. It's just waiting, it's, it's, it's a continuous cycle. You know, we're waiting for our GitLab pipeline. We get the status, has it finished yet? No, okay, back to the start again we go. They're really simple. These, these are designed by AWS to be human readable. So for someone to see what this workflow does, they don't need to go and read a 10,000 line YAML file. You know YAML, the easy to read language. They don't need to go and put an ID on the machine to go and read hundreds of lines of code. That is an exported screenshot from AWS console itself. So let's have a look at our path. If we go down the left-hand side, so we've said, is it a create or is it a delete? Okay, it's, it's, it's a create. So we'll go call account factory. Now, the account factory that AWS has so very kindly put a very small UI in front of is basically a service catalog product. Now, service catalog products from AWS are brilliant. You can create your own, you can group resources in, pop them in, fill a form in, click go, and away you go, it's a vending machine. That's all it is. So why not make use of the APIs that are with that and, and go down it? So we call Account Factory. There's a little bit of magic behind the scenes wizardry that goes on here. I'll explain that in a bit further. Once it's done though, this is where it gets nice to have step functions. With AWS's Account Factory form, you click go and it was done. Happy days, there you go, there's an account. It's empty, it's got nothing in it whatsoever. There's now some manual steps if you want more resources put into it or if you wanna go and get some credentials and play around with it. Whereas we've integrated our CI tool of choice. So we've gone with GitLab. As soon as this is done, the step function's able to acknowledge that it's done and send a, a trigger off to GitLab to say, do you know what it is? Can you go run our pipeline now, please? for this particular account. And that pipeline goes, yeah, sure, no problem. Here's our standard template of CDK code that we've got, and we're gonna go and deploy your VPCs. We're gonna do a deploy all your subnets. We're gonna go put some load balancers in. We're gonna go put NAT gateways in. We're gonna go deploy your standard roles and accounts, S3 buckets, SCPs, the lot. That would have been an additional time bit onto that original slide that we saw. 35 minutes per account, yeah, but how long is it gonna to take to then go into each account and deploy them or to go into your CI tool and trigger a job for each one? Bear in mind that each time it's probably gonna want some information about the account, the account ID, who's gonna run it, where is it, what availability zones do you wanna use? We can collect all that information from the output of the state machine and pass it into the next tool. You've got complete control. It even sits and it says, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll wait for GitLab to finish. Because what's the point in telling everyone that your account's ready if it's not? Yes, the account's ready, but can I, can I hand it to a developer and say, start developing it? No, because you know the database that they want doesn't exist yet, or the, the role that they need to even log into it doesn't exist yet. So we ask, okay, what's, what's the status of the pipeline? Pip, GitLab, and GitLab goes, it's, it's done. Happy days, down we go. If it's not done, I'll just wait a bit longer and we'll go again. You notice that top box has gone orange? That's a, that's a handled error. Now, at the top, we said, okay, we wanna create it, but what if this account is accidentally being duplicated? It'll go, okay, I'll tell you what, that's fine. I'll not create a new one for you because I can see that you've given me the same email address. I'll just go and get the details because what, what is it that maybe this was a, an older account? Maybe it's one that you created manually. You know, you've, you've got your little Greenfield company here again. They've got the five accounts suddenly what they've developed has gone global. It's phenomenal, it's brilliant, they need 100 accounts. Are they just gonna bin off those five accounts that they created manually? I would argue probably not. Whether that's the best thing to do or not, I don't know, that's, that's up to them. But if we ran this and put the same email address in and we put the same details in, rather than trying to recreate it, it'll go, I'll tell you what, we tried, but we saw that that was already created, but we need the information for that account to pass to GitLab because although those accounts work, they don't have all the standards and the offering that we've now developed since then that we want into the account. So it goes off and it goes, you know what it is, I'm gonna go and search the provision products 
and I'm going to describe the record and bring it back. And then we can continue that cycle again of enabling our CI tool to populate all the information we want. So what about, oh, for some reason up is back and down is next on this clicker. Uh, it's backwards, I don't like it. Let's have a look at the deletion path then. So create a delete, we'll delete it. Okay, well, because all the information is stored somewhere, it's entirely up to you where you want to store it. We'll go through some options later on. It goes and searches for that provision product. It will then describe the record so that it's got all the information it needs, such as DID, where it lives, its current status. Our pipeline says, you know what it is, I tell you what, we, we, we're going to move this into a specific OU that we've got four suspended accounts. We put them there to ring fence them. You know, there's no access, there's SCPs in place to make sure they can't be used. We're then going to close the account and we delete the provisioned product. From pushing go, that took 0 0.6 seconds, I think it was on my example. It's really, really nice and fast. And because you've likely got some tool in front of this, storing it as a drop down list. You don't have to go into AWS master account and go and find your account and move it to different OUs and go and select which account ID it is, which may not be in readable form. That may be a number. You may have a drop down box in front of this that you click, oh, I want that account, click go. 0 0.6 seconds. I doubt anyone could have filled that form in in that time. Again, orange, Unca a court error. So it's saying, look, we're going to move the account to the suspended OU. What that's saying is, look, it's already there. So the Lambda errored. But rather than just going, oh, do you know what it is? Let's just kill the process off. Something went wrong. Similar to what we saw on the other side on the create, it's handled it. It's gone, ah, right, okay, I see that you've told me that it's already there. Well, I know that that's okay. That's not going to fail the end of this process. Things aren't going to suddenly stop working just because it's in the right place to where it wants. Let's just continue down. And you can see it does. Closes the account, deletes the prison. It's worth noting though that it doesn't just instantly close the account. It goes into an automatic suspended state for 30 days, I think it is, to which point it then goes. If you want it back, you're going to have to contact AWS to unsuspend it and bring it back, which we're doing. <laughs> These things happen. So it's, it's good that it doesn't instantly delete it. So I mentioned the fact that this call account factory at the top left there had a little bit of magic wizardriness to it. Here it is. It's clever, but it's really simple. So the step function on the left triggers an AWS Lambda. That Lambda has been given, as well as all the details that it's needed, it's been given a task token, which is really important at this point. Now it takes that task token and it pops it into DynamoDB. And at the same time, it fires off an AWS account creation. And then what does Lambda do? Lambda do does what it does best, it dies. It goes, I'm done. You know, my purpose has been served, goodbye. And off it goes. AWS count creation, as we said, can take up to 35 minutes. We don't know. Might be five minutes, might be 10 minutes, might be the 35 minutes. Hell, AWS might have an issue on that day and it could be an hour. Unlikely. Most of these take a lot less time than that. Point being, it's an unknown <coughs> amount of time. But once the AWS account has been created, the default event bus is triggered with an event. That triggers another Lambda, so that we've got a rule sat listening for a filter for an event on that event bus. That Lambda comes back to life, and it says, all oh, right, okay. It's time to go back and tell AWS step function that it's, it's, it's time to continue. But we've got five running at the same time. So how does it know which one can go again. How does step function know, oh yeah, this is a legitimate request to move on. Goes back to DynamoDB and it pulls out that task token and it hands it back. I, I'm guessing that's not particularly clear for people. It's, uh, it's a lot of code in a small space. The points that I'm trying to, to kind of show here is essentially this block down here. Maybe I should have just shown that. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? What you'll see is that this is the definition code that triggered that GitLab, uh, sorry, that, that triggered the 
create account. And the point being at the bottom right, that you can see that under the payload, not only do you have the account being passed through with all its data, you have a task token, which is dynamically created at this point. And you can also see, although, well, these people at the front will be able to see, that the resource here is invoke wait for task token. It will sit and it will wait for that particular token to come back, not a random one, the one that it sent, which is nice because it means you can have the five sat there concurrently and the right one comes back and we move on. So at this point, how do we start it? Well, we went with a really simple approach. We went with a CSV file for now. It's not a finished product. I did say that at the start. There are definitely improvements to this that we want to make, and there are definitely improvements that we are and have made. But how many people here don't know what a CSV file is? Yeah, KISS, right? Keep it simple. <laughs> There's a, an example line of this. So the user can go and create a CSV file through their software of choice. Excel probably. It's a really nice, easy way to read it. Give the account a name, put the, user name, uh, the email address in, give the account an email, give it a name, the organization unit. Is it a create or delete? For anyone who doesn't know, that's what it then looks like. All we do is we pass that in S3. S3's then got a bit of a rule, an event on that, that triggers that step function. I tried to time how long that was. I could not physically time it. It's, it's instant. By the time that I'd press go and move to the other tab, step function was shown that there was an iteration running. So I'm just going to say it's instant. I mean, it's, it's as close as to as you're going to get. I mean, that's wonderful. But how does it help you? How does it help us? How does it help anyone who wants to put this kind of thing in place? Let's have a look at some of the benefits. Time saved. It's a fire and forget solution to some degree. If we go back earlier on and we said, you know, 95 hours to create 120 accounts, does anybody here want to sit and spend that time doing it? No, absolutely not. I would imagine everyone's got better things to do with their time, even if it's watching Netflix during the day if you shouldn't be. <laughs> it's fire and forget. So we can enable this through the CSV file upload or whatever you want to put in front of it, and you can literally just leave it alone. It doesn't matter whether you're doing a hundred at a time, a thousand at a time, one at a time, because the step function, you can add additional functionality at the end. You can bolt on an SQS, an SNS. You can put CloudWatch alarms, all sorts in to alert the user that it's been done. Or if there's an error, catch it alarm it. We don't have to sit there and go, oh, is it done yet? Or start it, go away for an hour, do some technical useful work, come back and go, oh, it finished half an hour ago. But your new customer who wanted that account immediately has waited an extra half an hour now because you didn't know it had been done or you had better things, better use of your time. Why not add an extra field in with their email address so as soon as it's done, they know. And again, putting back in the extra logic that we did with our CI pipeline, not only is the account created, you know, we could have different stages. We could give them a feedback loop. So we could say, look, we've gotten your request. We're working on it. We could then get another one saying, look, your AWS account's created. By all means, go and have a look. But you'll find that most of your resources aren't there because we're just waiting for our pipeline to run. And then when it gets to the end, thank you very much. You know, here's your account. Maybe have a link into the console or give them instructions on how to use CLI access. Point is, from that point of click go, whew, walk away. Less AWS access is required. I mean, for someone to upload to S3, as so long as you give them an endpoint, essentially there's no access required. Depending on how you interact with starting this, no AWS access could be required. You could even argue that it's a low skill slash no skill job. Data inputting, you know, I would, I would probably say most of us could sit with a list and just put them into a CSV file and go. Or better yet, hand it to the person that wants it. 
rather than having a particular team. So we go back to the old school, we, you know, we're a startup company and boss comes along and says, okay, new delivery manager starting. And they've said that we need two new accounts. Can someone create them, please? Yeah, okay. Someone's gonna spend an hour doing that. If you've got a contractor on an hourly rate, you know exactly how much that costs. And it won't be as cheap as it is to go, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you just give them this form to fill in and they can do it themselves? It allows integration with CI, CD, which is a massive one. The offering that AWS give as an account factory is that's it. It is an account factory. It does no more than creating the account. And I've mentioned a number of times here how we can expand on the functionality of that by triggering pipelines, whether that be GitLab, whether that be Jenkins, whether that be your own custom scripts that run on the boxes. Maybe it's AWS's own solutions. Maybe it's code pipeline. <laughs> Point is, it expands on the possibilities and the functionality that you have out of the box. You get multiple options for triggering the solution. So AWS's solution is, is minimal. You've got, a, you've got a UI on the front of it that you go to when you fill in. I don't think Account Factory has a CLI, does it? It might. I've not seen it. Probably because if you've seen it, you've wanted to use a CLI and you've probably built something better. Couple of ideas, CS3 to S3. You might want CICD itself to trigger this. So maybe you want everything to start in whatever tool you're using. Jenkins, GitLab, GitHub. It goes off, it triggers it, and it comes back to it. Maybe you want to use some third-party tool like Retool. Really, really nice one that was introduced to myself via James not long ago. Really quick, it's been an upfront ends and UIs. It integrates with AWS seamlessly. It's really, really nice. It would take, I would argue, someone no longer than an hour to build a UI to hand to your business that gives you drop downs and lists in nice fields. If you've got specific naming conventions for accounts, there's nothing stopping someone in the AWS console going in and typing whatever they want. Put something in front of it that does the governance. Problem solved. <clears throat> you could build a custom UI if you wanted. Go off and build it on prem. AWS, however you want. Point is, with the step function being able to be triggered so easily, the option's yours. I appreciate that that was really, really, really fast and it was really high level. I stated at the start, the idea of this wasn't to show you how to build a step function. It wasn't to go through how we're gonna do everything and boo every bit of code. I'm trying to get people to start thinking about the possibilities of beyond what AWS offer as a service out of the box. Is AWS wonderful? I think so, I think it's brilliant. It certainly gives us the ability to expand, to go further than what we could do on-prem in a much shorter time. Is it perfect? Far from it. Account Factory was one option for that. Do have one more slide, but now seems like a good time to just pause and open the floor if anyone's got any questions. Sorry? Organizational units an issue in what way do you mean by an issue? Yes, so it will ask where you want it to live. Uh, so uh, it's the account factory and control tower offering does assume that you're making use of AWS organizations. It's expecting that this isn't just Joe Blog sat at home doing his AWS certifications with his one single free account. It's expecting that this is to some degree an enterprise level and that you've put in organizational units to tie things in. So it will ask where it wants it to be. It also, when you delete it, we've wrapped it around to move it to a suspended one. We haven't at the minute made use of it to create the OUs because it's just not nice to do. Plus you've then got to go and register them separately. It won't it won't register them with AWS organizations. Does that answer the question? Excellent. One Anyone else? There was another hand went up somewhere. Yep. Got that, <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> Excellent.
Is there a reason why you trigger GitLab from set functions rather than GitLab to set functions? So you create your pipe, you have your CD tape resources, you trigger the pipeline, which then triggers the set functions rather than triggering GitLab from? Um, no, is, is the honest answer. So we had no solution to start with. We were going through the manual process of creating them, and we thought, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so one of the members of my team, it, I didn't build this. I'm going to give credit. The team's worked fantastically to put this together. We all know how it works, and we've all made use of it. But there's another member of the team who spent a lot of his time developing this, and it's already improved. He's already gone down that line of, oh, I've got a 1,000 ideas, and I've only got time to put 100 of them in. But we had nothing. So building this and triggering it from here, for us, made the first logical step because our CDK, but well, because we use CDK, it needs an account in order to, to push things into. It's not like Terraform where it has its own state. The state is the account. So we decided, okay, well, we're going to start with this and we'll start with something completely off, i.e. CSV file. We will look to move that probably to something like retool or to a custom UI. But for us, it made sense. I would argue that if someone's already got a really nicely developed CI tool, do it the way you've mentioned. Ask for it to populate things and then push up. Our CI tool can start this. So within the repository, there is a copy of that CSV file. If you change that and commit it to the repo, it will upload that CSV file to the S3, therefore triggering it. But that meant things got a bit messy because you know we've got merge request approval rules and all sorts on that. So it gave us a way to skip the approvals for the code because that has no bearing on what's going to happen next. But yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't do it the other way. Yeah, I only come from a place of doing it the other way around, so I was just wondering if it works for you, it works for you. We may well look to do that in the future. Like I said before, you know, there's no right or wrong way of doing this. There's ways that suit you as, a, as an individual, as a developer, as, and as a company. If you want to sit and use the form, you can. No one's here to tell you that that's not the right thing to do. I mean, I'd, I'd consider your sanity, but that's, 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 that's entirely up to yourself. Was there another question? Sorry, did I see any hands? Have you remembered your question? Yes. Excellent. Are you concerned that uh, they might up the concurrency limit on how many accounts can be traced in parallel? That might render the tool bit less useful? No. If they up the concurrency account on this, this will make this tool even more useful. Because if you put, say, that to 100, someone's still got to go in and fill that form out 100 times. And they've still got to then monitor to check when the account's created. And you're still then limited to the fact that once the AWS account's created, it's done. It doesn't know to do anything else, such as trigger a pipeline, deploy some resources, wrap policies in, move to a different OU, whatever. Whereas if it moves to 100 and we've got this in, we can just get through them a lot faster. You know, We would change it from running five at a time to running 100 at a time. And the time required is, is even less. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, so you've actually got like 100, 100 plus accounts. Yeah. Is there a scenario that you've seen or anticipate where if a particular service or resource that you want to update has all 120 accounts, how would you, do you have like an automated way of doing that? Like yes, so? but it's not through this. So this for us is purely around creating the accounts and deleting the accounts. So that pipeline that we've got triggering has multiple ways of running. It will either run for one account, if it's passed from here and it's given an ID of an account and it will go, okay, see you want this, let me populate it with dev resources, let me populate it with pre-prod, prod resources, you know, depending on which one it is. I mean, we would create four at a time, so we have a dev, sit, pre and prod environment. If we were wanting to roll a change out to every single one of them, we run that same pipeline again, either from another repo where some of the, maybe the level three constructs live or maybe some of the code source is in the same repo. But if we push it without that, it assumes that it wants to do them all. And it's quite clever. It's dynamic in the child pipelines. So it'll go off and it'll pull every single account down from AWS and it'll go, okay, out of this, I'll, I just want the dev accounts and it'll produce a list. It'll then say, okay, I'll tell you what, put them to one side and just give me three of them, please. These are my Canary accounts. 
and it will deploy the new changes to these accounts. Once it's done, there's a manual intervention stage that says, look, we are happy with what you did. Oh no, it's on fire. Please undo, go back, roll back, we'll make use of environments. If we are good, we click go. That manual stage is an approval and it'll do the rest. Again, we have a couple of stages for the environments, but that will then push those changes out to them all. This solution doesn't touch that unless we're maybe looking to change or add a load of different accounts at the same time. Any other questions? Knew you were going to ask one. <laughs> easy one. Easy. I was just wondering whether you've automated the deletion as well, so like you've got a set function for the other way around. So, yeah, so it is. It, it's under the same set function. So the very first decision tree at the top was whether it was a create or delete. If it deletes it, it goes through and it pulls the details of the account that's being asked to be deleted. It will move it to a suspended OU where we know it lives, so we don't have suspended accounts all over the place in case we need to pull them back. And then it triggers the deletion process. So the same step function handles both sides. Again, like we say, the minute it's CSV file, so you'd have to put the details in, but putting a custom UI in front of it, you could link up to a query that pulls all the accounts. And now you've got a nice drop down, or you've got a free text search that'll search them in, in real time. Any of this? Awesome. Little bonus slide they added on at the end then. So how have we improved the solution at the minute? This is a last minute thing. That's really not easy to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, to give a little bit more so we can see the CSV files push through, triggers the step function events, and we've got it here. So we can see at the top that we parse each entry, CSV entry and run in parallel. So that's what we're talking about before. At the minute, it knows that it's concurrency is five and it'll do five at a time. Concurrency goes up, we wrap ours up and we, we rack through that CSV file so much faster. The delete side hasn't really changed, but the, the create side has. So rather than sending off the different lambdas and stuff, I think a lot of it's now handled within the step function. I'm saying I think because this got landed on me a about three hours before the end of my day, and I haven't read through it to see exactly what it is. It does the way the status check is completed within the same function now. It doesn't send it off to separate DynamoDBs or Lambdas or anything like that. It's all handled nicely within the state machine, uh, within the step function rather. Regardless of whether that was already there or not, we still get to the same gather account details. So earlier on, this side completed, and then we kind of got to triggering the bike pipeline and the account deals were only gathered if it already existed that now happens regardless and we can see that we have actually added this additional step in so we've got apply account tags so that we can group these more logically for example environments so that we know by the time it gets to the developer they can see through the resource tags or even the billing what environment it is that's been pushed in you can see that we trigger the big pipeline but we go and get the api secret which I believe is in KMS, in Secrets Manager. Yes, not KMS. It's protected by KMS. It goes off, it waits and comes back and it completes and the iteration's done. Functionally, no change, but under the hood, there's quite a lot of optimization and it means that we don't have to wait and put back offs and things like that. In. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. I do appreciate it. Um, if you've got any questions afterwards, reach out. I'm going to stick around for a little bit in case anyone wants to have a chat.